Welcome to Hot Takes on Society. Hello everyone and welcome to News of the Week. Today I'm going to take a topic which I recently found in a newspaper. It's called um, UGC Proposes 40% Online Teaching. And um, so This is the article from the Times of India and basically um, a lot of uh, newspapers have covered this. Uh, but I just wanted to show you what they say. And um, let's see what really uh, is happening here. I'll go a little bit detail, uh, so stick with me. They want to keep 40% online and 60% offline. And this, there's an exception for Swayam courses. The proposal is in draft, and we will be reviewing the dra draft content. Uh, they're saying there are a lot of uh, new examination types that they want to implement. And um, so it's interesting. This particular graphic uh, explains this, and I think this is a very good graphic. In fact, um, w because if you actually look at the document, these six are, or seven, sorry, are noted down perfectly, and we'll be going through them in detail. So the next paragraph is the internal assessment. They want to create a portal. Um, in that portal, they want to uh, create an interactive session between staff and students, and the document is very interesting. This really just flattens it if I'm being honest with you. Um, so we'll be looking at that. It also prescribes minimum basic facilities for online teaching. Um, and so basically what they're saying is that um, uh, there should be a facilitation for uh, the video uh, and the online part of things. The infrastructure should be there. And um, so those are the proposals that they are saying. Uh, the main concept here is to identify learning gaps and provide feedback. So like an interactive learning session where uh, we are using digital or software tools, computer tools, in order to achieve uh, the goals of teaching uh, student to teacher interaction um, and to keep the syllabus kind of open. And uh, that's basically what they're saying there. This is all the article is. And uh, uh, there are a lot of nuances you can go into. And uh, they're just not showing it here. They're saying there's a lot of le le resistance to blended learning from faculty, students, and regulatory body. The resistance has been evaporated due to the pandemic and national security policy. Implementation must be done after analyzing the learning outcome, the existing SWIM online courses. So SWIM is basically a pilot project which the government of India is running, where they offer online courses. And so I think they're offering degrees from it. I'm not really intimately familiar with SWIM, but it's basically online courses and they want to, it's like a pilot project, they want to see if it succeeds. Now the paragraph where it says there's a lot of resistance and after the pandemic it's evaporated is absolutely false uh, because if you do go and search for the articles related to this, there are several articles where students and teachers are actually voicing out a lot of real issues uh, that these guys are talking about and uh, this point of eva evaporated is absolute nonsense. In fact, if you go to the Times of India website, there's only one comment on there uh, as of today's date, 29th May 2021. And uh, in that comment, um, it looks like it is a student. Um, that person basically says, this online course stuff is nonsense. We have suffered during the pandemic. We don't want more of it. So I just wanted to put that out there. This was the public notice that was issued on the 20 20th of May. 2021. So if you look at the draft document, it's 48 pages and I just, I went through it. We'll go through it one by one. So the first idea is that they want to ch change the instruction methodology, uh, the approach uh, that teachers take and the approach that students take to a classroom. What they want to do basically, and they mentioned this in these first two, three paragraphs, is that we want to uh, create a digital environment, a workspace basically, in the digital space where students and teachers can interact. In fact, students will have to attend a lot of the online courses. Uh, and then in the class, what happens is um, the sessions will be mainly um, interactive sessions and question and answer sessions, or it'll be uh, team building sessions. It'll be more provocative. It'll be more project oriented. And uh, there's a lot of those things happening. And so if you notice the second paragraph, it says, Resources such as video lectures, podcasts, recordings, and articles were provided in order to transfer the main bulk of 
necessary knowledge from teacher to student before each class. This frees up time in class for teachers to support students in activities, lead discussions, and facilitate engagement. So this is the basic idea of what they're trying to do here. They want to maximize uh, class time by saying, OK, listen, uh, you do the lecture part at home. You come in, and we will do discussions and activities on these topics. And the third paragraph is basically talking about the national education policy. So the last one was in 1986. It was released during Rajiv Gandhi's time. And the main focus of the national edu education policy at that time was to reach um, education uh, higher and uh, school education to the remotest villages, to reach the unreached people, to reach uh, people, castes that were, you know, basically uh, away from the system of education that we have in our country. And in fact, they also wanted to, you know, make a lot of the options free. The focus there and the focus here is very different. Here they're talking about changing the way classrooms work. But let's, let's if, we, if we are actually looking at it, this is a UGC proposal. And so this will only apply to bachelor's and master's degree. This will not apply to uh, schools. So if you read the first sentence, you'll notice that the student centricity means that availability of multiple entry and exit points, promotion of mother tongue and other languages, focus on arts and humanities. Um, well, that's a lot of nonsense there, but what I would say is that this student centricity, this word uh, is throughout the document. And uh, it does make a little bit of sense because there are, there are proposals in there. Um, which is trying to achieve those goals. So if you look at the third paragraph, there's this one academic bank of it is a credit system that is uh, available uh, digitally. And what happens is the, the courses you take and the credits they offer, they get uploaded. And so what happens is credits get added to your, it's like a bank. Um, if you complete a course, those, the credits for this course gets added to your bank account, something like that. Uh, it's an interesting concept. A lot of global ideas uh, put in the Indian education policy, and uh, which I will talk about. Uh, so, the education transformation here is just is these five things. Right? They basically want to um, create a pick time teachers and timings, frame your courses, design your degrees, study through any more learning or exams on demand. Uh, this is a very interesting thing because this is very, very wide and very far-reaching. I think it's uh, ambitious. In fact, I think it's overly ambitious to the point where it doesn't look practical, many of the things. So, for example, when they say pick teachers and timing, VIT does this a lot. So, what VIT does is you study the coursework and you go through the coursework and then you have to form a group of students and call the professor for class. So it's like class on demand. And so you can, uh, the, the professor will schedule a timing. And so basically what happens is you don't have to attend hours and hours and hours of lecture. You can call for lectures and attend them when necessary. And uh, I think this is very interesting uh, because what happens is it's not a top-up approach where the syllabus is set the schedule is set by the department. This is a more bottom-up approach where the students have to take interest in the subject and in, in, in learning, and they have to call up the professor and fix his schedule. And um, what it does is it weeds out people that are interested to those people that are not interested. It's like a self-learning pattern. It's self-motivation. And uh, I think that's good. So it's frame your courses. This is a very interesting phenomenon here. So basically what they're saying is that uh, when you take up a degree course, uh, we will keep a lot of these courses flexible. Meaning, if you take a, say, engineering degree, but midway you don't want to do it, what happens today is you have to discontinue and then take up an, another new course and start from the beginning. Rather than that, what they're saying is you can mix up your courses, you can take different topics, you can integrate your courses, and um, based on how much credits you gain in each course, you'll be given a degree or a diploma. You know, and they're saying we can have standards for degrees and diplomas, and uh, this is why the academic academic uh, bank credit system works. You know, where you keep adding credits 
based on the subjects you're interested in. And uh, what happens is, as the more and more you add, uh, you can either get a degree or a diploma. And um, I think it's very interesting. There are some proposals that you can take vocational training in this thing. So I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is done in foreign countries. For your information, in Europe and America, a lot of the courses are flexible because a lot of students, they go into a course, they don't know, they're not interested, but then they diversify and you see, and this is something they're trying to bring in. I think this is very good. Design your degree, so exactly what I'm saying. You know, students framing their courses, designing their degrees. Um, study through any more. Now, this is um, where a lot of the pushback is because they are saying we have to do a lot of digital and uh, less analog. And um, yeah, there are some concerns there. Learning or exams on demand. So, exams when ready. So, right now, what happens is if you don't write an exam or you're not prepared for an exam, let's say there are uh, there's four years to complete a degree, but you couldn't do it. Uh, you felt that it, you needed another six months um, to, to complete your degree. Today, what happens is you cannot skip le skip courses, uh, push them to a next semester or something like that. Write exams when you're ready. And this last point here, I think is very crucial. Um, I think it's extremely important. Um, I faced this when I studied my bachelor's degree. Uh, that could be a game changer because what that does is that motivates the students to go and study their coursework and put a lot of pressure and actually gain the knowledge and do it, which is very interesting. This also gives the opportunity for students to like take a break and get internships, um, take a break and you know maybe do a project or something like that. This is fantastic if I'm being honest with you. This is something that I always crave for. In um, foreign countries, Western countries, this is there. I actually put this out because I thought there, there were some important elements here, but most of the elements I've already covered. So uh, if you look at the six building blocks, so this is an important key factor. Any subject combination that would include specialization, interdisciplinary, fracturing, normal and skill or vocational courses at par, exactly. So to get a degree, um, you don't have to learn exactly what is today there are many ways you can achieve your degree your degree can be very diverse based on your interests and so that's exactly what they're talking about and they're trying to make vocational courses on par with other uh, courses now i guess what they would do is basically change the credit system so vocational courses get less credits like practicals do flexible flexible education or the merging of regular distance online and virtual mode. So this is another key aspect, the digital aspect. Flexibility will be given to students to study in any national or international institution. Now this is, um, in my opinion, uh, very, very interesting because I don't think they can actually achieve this. Um, it, it does seem a little on dreamland. Uh, converting credits into degrees and diplomas. So this concept I've already spoken enable lifelong learning process so that the notion of fixed time for education is done away with the option of multiple entry and exit points exactly so just because you couldn't finish your course doesn't mean you have to drop out of it if you know what i mean right there are ways to enter the education the ways to exit it and they're giving you multiple entry and exit points and i think this is exactly how our education should be the opportunity for the students to indulge in pot or type of course leading to something called a bachelor's or liberal education events of credits not adding up to a specific discipline um, this is again very very contentious in my opinion because the job market is cutthroat um, i do not know how the job market will react to a pot uh, if we're being absolutely honest when they say undoubtedly there are some key advantages in this line um, this Draft, unfortunately, gives a very rosy picture. Very, very rosy picture. I would encourage you to read it because a lot of things are not practical. You know, there are so many things that you can theoretically do. Practically, they don't really, it's very difficult to achieve. And even if you achieve it, you never know uh, what you will face when you do it. So these are some of the important features. So this is what they're calling this whole concept. It's called blended learning. And this is they're widely available in foreign countries. 
right, where there's teacher and student interaction, responsibility of learning is with the students, increased student engagement in learning. Well, I will attest to this. A lot of students, they come courses or whatever, and any courses for that matter, they're not really interested in it. But this will just change that time management, flexibility, improve students. I mean, these are great stuff. We've already spoken about this. So, notice this blended learning. This will be the concept they use throughout this whole thing. So, here's an example. Now, this is something I want to talk about. So, they're saying that let's say that there's a course like this with four subjects, and each subject takes 60 hours of classroom time, and there are four kids for each. Now, what they're saying is uh, what they will say here is that. 50% will be online, 50% will be offline, right? So 30 hours in the class, 30 hours outside the class. In the 30 hours outside the class, uh, you will be listening to lectures. And, um, in the 60 hours in the class, you will be doing activities, troubleshooting, problem solving. And uh, this is in point two. The idea here is that you would have learned something. You will come and critically analyze that in class. So your brain will start working. In a, in a way of analyzing problems, create, coming up with solutions. And, you know, that's actually very true. Um, so this allows students to join the MOOC uh, e-learning stuff. The students are submitting assignments. So this is a very interesting concept which will come later on. Um, I think I will reserve it for later on because it's, it's very nice, especially uh, for students that um, need certain kinds of uh, activities which would be better pulled in. And um, I will talk about this a little later. This is the uh, ICT. ICT meaning these are initiatives and tools that are used for education. Now, today you have things like the NPTL, NMIEC, ICT, EPG, NDL, and these are all portals where coursework is available, hours and hours of coursework of subject matters in almost all subjects and you can access these for your educational resources and the idea is that the government wants to create servers where these these materials will be there and students can access them and SWIM and MOOC resources, uh, so MOOC is uh, basically uh, providing a lot of class classroom features like quizzes, study materials, videos, online exams. So basically, the teachers can give assignments online and the students go and access it. And so uh, the idea here is that you have to create databases to achieve these things. And I'm guessing school colleges can do that. A lot of the colleges do that even today. They have databases. They, have, uh, they, they do it mainly through email infrastructure. This is more or less proposing something similar, but just on an app level structure. It's giving a little more structure to what practices already exist in part and I would encourage you to read that. Now, the most interesting thing of all of this is 3.4 where they say there are other initi innovative initiatives. Now, if you look at the document, but, uh, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of uh, work here so I didn't bring it all into the presentation. If you look at the document, they're talking about things like Sim Lab Plus, Virtual Lab. These are all open source uh, virtual lab facilities, and some of them are licensed, some of them are not licensed. The idea here is that if there's a database, students can go and access these online licensed tools, and they will be able to use them as and when they want. They talk about twenty four seven in the in, in the coursework, and I'm very suspicious about that because. Indians don't work on a 24-7 basis in school and college education. Um, not all of them are going to sit up late at night and do all this stuff. But, you know, it's it's interesting. I would say it's very interesting. Um, because for a guy like me uh, who did engineering, a lot of the course uh, tools have got very costly licenses. And our, even our college didn't buy them. So it's crazy. So something like this, you know, where there's a common database where you can use shared licenses, it's, it's amazing. And the idea here is to do this more at a global level, which I not really, I don't really understand. I don't see the point of it. Um, and then there's this other thing in 3.5 where there's collaboration. So basically in the MOOC system, the teachers give you assignments, they give you quizzes, 
they ask you to do coursework and then say do this do this and improve your knowledge in the collaboration area there are things like whiteboard blogging sticky notes shared documents where you can interact with other students interact with the teacher now all of this does sound a little cheesy from the indian perspective but this is how it is now the implementation of bl now this i don't want to go into too much detail this is talking about how to implement it uh, but there's uh, one point here in uh, in pedagogies, right, 4.2, they're talking about how to generate ideas, brainstorming, conceptual mapping. So this all comes under the same concepts we talked about in uh, uh, 3.5 for ICT tool for collaboration, where, you know, you are sharing ideas, you are brainstorming, you're being creative, uh, you're doing case studies, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, all of this is very cheesy for the Indian audience. It's all rosy and good, but when it comes to it, we, we mostly won't do it unless it is forced upon us. Um, so there's a lot of material of what should be done. Now, one problem I have, and this I will keep emphasizing, there is a section called 4.4.2. What's interesting about this section is it's talking about what kind of devices the student should have, what kind of infrastructure the education or whoever it is should do. If you look at what is required for the students, there are like um, eight requirements. And um, frankly speaking, um, I don't think even rich students have all these things. That's what makes this whole thing kind of like a pipe dream at the moment. Um, and all of those student questions, right, that evaporated, quote unquote, um, those were these concerns. In these eight points, they're preposterous. If you just look at it, it's preposterous. It's mobile phones, lab devices, audiovisual devices, graphic board tablets with stylus. I mean, what? Tab based remote sensing, satellite based TV channel, what? Low cost IoT devices like Raspberry, yeah, low cost because it's 5,000 rupees. Remote VPN. I mean, think about these things. It's crazy. Um, it will fall upon the college to do all this, and the college cannot supply all of this for all the students at all times. That's that's crazy. You have libraries full and overflowing. There are a lot of things, uh, even for the you know centralized database level, which is very, very, very audacious. I don't think we can achieve this very fast. Assessment and evaluation. Now, this section I like. This is changing the way we do our assessment and evaluation, in, which is 0.5. And these are the six points. Great stuff. Oral examinations, group examinations, open book examinations, on-demand examinations. Well, let me tell you something. This is amazing. You know, we have e-portfolio, e this internal assessment thing. It already exists. Online quizzes don't exist. Artificial intelligence tools for proctoring assessments to check concentration level, speed, and depth. Well, this is very debatable. This looks like a money-grabbing ploy, but these six things, um, they're great. One we are already doing, but this group set, group examination, open book exam, I mean, if, you, if I'm honest with you, that's very nice. I really like that um, because the idea of group examination is that you have to do presentations, and, you know, this basically improves the average performance of the class. And this is, these are things that, you know, I've been crying out and uh, all this is coming out as proposals after I've come out for the learning. And this basically is a summary of everything we have seen. Um, basically, it's talking about what teachers must do in identifying learning gaps, helping students close it down. It talks about test and assessment. It talks about how the student mentality will change. It's basically a summary. So uh, we will just skip through that. You, you are welcome to go through these, through these documents. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, but I just thought I'd do the hard work for you. That's uh, why I'm skipping through this because this is basically just a conclusion of everything we've discussed. It's just that it goes in a little bit detail. Now comes the important part. So my take on this, right? Now, 
I think a lot of the proposals here are very good, very audacious, and it has to be uh, because uh, we seem to only update our education policy every 30 years. So uh, it has to be audacious. I accept that. Um, but there is no proposal on what time frame is there to implement all of this. A lot of these things are extremely, extremely difficult and need a lot of money. So for example, uh, the basic concept of this is a blended learning. Okay? When you talk about digital and offline interaction, students, so I have been in these classes. I've attended these uh, courses on MPTL. And if I'm being honest with you, it's not good, you know. When you watch a video, right, it's so easy to retain concentration for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe 25 to 30 minutes on a highly technical topic. The problem is when professors start solving problems because those take one-hour classes. And personally, I think the idea that you have to replace all lecture into video format is kind of going in the wrong direction. Because this, it really doesn't benefit the student. Um, I don't know if it's psychological or whatever, but it's so much easier to attend a one-hour classroom session offline than a one-hour classroom se session online, if I'm being absolutely honest with you. The same does not apply for short form. If you're talking about 15 to 20 minute videos, I mean, those things are great. If that's the length, I mean, that'll be amazing. What you can do is you can have 20 minute videos, 15 minute videos, um, preparing the students for the class, and you come to class and you expand on those ideas. Maybe give the students some time to debate and discuss you know, all those kind of things. But um, when they talk about these ICT initiatives that are already available to be used, I think it, you're kind of looking at areas which students are going to complain about all the time because it just doesn't work that way. Um, these are all great uh, things on paper, but in reality, they don't work. I mean, I wouldn't accept that if I were a student, uh, and no, neither should anybody. It makes a lot of sense uh, not to do full lectures online. So this 40%, 60% stuff is, is, is really up for debate, in my opinion, right? Uh, teaching small concepts or core concepts or small problems, like one simple formula, all that works, but when you start going into complex topics and then trying to make a student attend one hour classes for 30 hours into six subjects, 180 hours online, no, that's that's not going to work. It's, it's just not going to work. And you will see a lot of students dropping out. They will not just go to other majors, they will simply drop out. They will lose interest. And um, that is going to create a lot of problems right? in our workforce as a society. We will have people that are underperforming uh, at the college level. Um, what will happen is there will only be 1% of students that rise to the top. Everybody else will be at the bottom. I, I assure you, everybody else will not be in the middle. They'll be in the bottom. And uh, that's how it will be. And and that's it's just a symptom of these things, right? And I think that's very, very, very... Uh, that's pipe dream to think that it'll just work magically. I don't think it will. Um, this idea of motivation, self-motivation, uh, let me tell you something. It works to an extent. To do it the way they're talking about in this article, in, the, in this draft, no, it, it just doesn't work that way. So I'm going from the top, right? So a lot of the points that are bad are in the top, basically. Uh, so the role of this blended learning stuff and... Um, a lot of this is very interesting, and I like it a lot. But if I'm being absolutely honest with you, our teachers are not equipped for this kind of stuff. I mean, enhanced teacher-student inter interaction, uh, group discussion, brainstorming. Mm. Our teachers themselves are not equipped for this stuff. I do not know how you are going to come up with ideas to do this very greatly. Now, the best institutions in any field, whether it's sociology, politics, or um, 
engineering, sciences, social, language, wherever they are, um, the best are always going to do this. And they're going to be very effective. And people are going to start one following them. Um, but I do feel that if we do this without improving our school system, we're going to see a lot of problems. A lot of people are going to be left behind. Um, I always believe when you bring in economic education reform, it has to start from the school and it has to carry into the college. All these beautiful proposals for college, uh, especially with the digital learning, is all great, but I do think there will be a huge gap if you leave the school education behind and just focus on college education. Um, personally, I think that's very difficult because I'm not from the village, but I've seen people from the village that come and study high hopes and dreams and it just doesn't pan out. And rather than saying too bad, it's better if we can find ways to, you know, make sure that they also get the opportunities that the city guys get. You know, bring them into the college system. And just This will be very competitive. This is how it's going to be. It will be very competitive. And I, I, and I don't mind the competition. My point is, students should have at least some level of readiness. Unfortunately, students that can be meritorious but don't have the opportunity to get the best education will be left behind. We cannot just say that's too bad. I'm sorry. This is one of the reasons why the 1986 national education policy makes a lot of sense. The focus was on rural communities, tribal communities, and it has worked to a large extent. This implementation, see, this is where it's all gonna be falling apart because. If you're telling me the government is going to get this right, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. The infrastructure needed to create the data centers, the size, and the level of user interaction they're talking about. They're talking about getting user interaction from all over India, decentralized databases, and then connecting all of India to all of the world. When they talk about these international course studies and certifications, see, first of all, this idea of globalization stuff like that, you need to dial it that back a little bit because because it's it's very suspect and for where India is currently to talk about globalization it is terrible. I think it's absolutely terrible and the fact that they're pushing global principles into this college education here is again very, very suspect. See we're already sending all of our highly educated students abroad. Um, what we are going to do with this is we're going to push everybody out of the country. And, um, nobody's going to will be willing to work in the local economies because we will be vying for opportunities globally. And we'll just not improve our own societies. So maybe we need to dial this back a little bit. And I do think one of the issues with this with with any government infrastructure is that it does it just doesn't work. Computer infrastructure, I think. Um, Anna University's exam portal, for example, crashes on the day the exam is released. It's like they cannot handle it. Um, there are, there'll be a lot of infrastructure problems, especially if they're trying to take this all over India in a common fashion. Now, of course, I think the option should be, okay, you can be part of the academic bank of credits if you want to, if you want a blend of courses and you want to get a certificate which is very different from what will be reasonably offered. Um, I think students should be, should have the option to choose that if they want, or go with the college courses, right? For students that choose that kind of blend, all this online training and all of that, it makes a lot of sense in my opinion. So this is for the students that uh, join a university but don't necessarily follow the coursework, the patterns, and the syllabus of the university. Basically, they take half the training from the university and then the next half, they do it from everywhere. It's it's beneficial for those students. Um, and in a way, I think this is the advantage here, is that the students that will be thinking of going abroad maybe can get courses from abroad at an 
the degree will not be from foreign universities, the degree will be from this university, but the coursework will be from foreign universities, and it'll be up to the job market to accept these people as qualified and competent, right? And so the syllabus will has to be competitive. So one of the issues I do have with this, this draft in, in its overall concept is that the idea of changing the syllabus is not really on the forefront. There seems to be a change offered in the exam pattern, which is a good first step. But currently our syllabuses are very theoretical oriented, very little practical or practice oriented. And I understand they want to improve interaction within the class, but I do think that is very much waiting for something to burst open, but it just doesn't burst open. It's like a balloon that's filled with water, but it's at the edge of bursting and not bursting, except it's it's just not gonna burst. That's how it will be if you do this. You have to bring more practically oriented groundwork. And that's how you basically improve a society, from college to work. That transition to, should happen, and currently our syllabus just doesn't allow that. Doing all of this also will not allow that if I'm being honest with you. It, it's, like, it's like I said, the balloon that fills, that's at the edge of bursting and not bursting, but it never bursts. That's how it is. The balloon should burst, and you have to push the students to that. For that, you need to dial back a little bit of the theory. That proposal is not there in the draft, uh, which is very discouraging, you know. Because there seems to be a lot of money to be thrown into this project and yet the syllabus which is the most important doesn't seem to be any change. Now the best part of this is the evaluation. I'm telling you this will improve everything. This will change a lot of things. I think this is a huge plus the way this is going to change. Another huge plus is, is the mixing and matching of degrees and diploma, right? Vocational courses. I think that's a huge plus and a lot of students will use that. Think about it, a lot of students will study, let's say, wireless and plant technology, and then they will, they will study, do business studies. They will go out and just start a business and maybe be successful. And you know what? That's how it should be. So it makes a lot of sense. So there are positives and negatives to this. And, uh, you know, this three article, I mean, I, I've done, I read the 48 pages. Some I just skimmed through because they were all just repetitions. Thank you for watching. The link will be in the description. You can go and read it yourself. Thank you for listening. Consider liking the video and comment if you have an opinion. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos of this kind. Thank you.